Good afternoon. This PowerPoint is related to cardiomyopathies. Let's do an overview first of the cardiomyopathies before we go into the different classification, etiology, pathophysiology, diagnosis, and treatment. What is cardiomyopathy? Well, basically is uh, is a primary disorder of the heart muscle. It is uh, distinct from structural cardiac disorders such as coronary disease or vascular disorders. Um, basically, um, causes abnormal myocardial performance and is not the result of any disease dysfunction. As I said, it has nothing related to myocardial infarction, hypertension, valvular stenosis, or regurgitation, even though these could be uh, some etiological uh, causes of uh, cardiomyopathies. Um, to be able to classify, um, the major three classifications of cardiomyopathies are dilated hypertrophic and restrictive. The term uh, ischemic cardiomyopathy refers to the dilated, is poorly contracting myocardium that can occur in patients with severe coronary artery disease, but this could occur with or without, uh, without areas of infarction. Although it does not describe a primary myocardial disorder, the, ter the term uh, for um, uh, cardiomyopathy remains uh, in common use. Um, we're going to go through etiology, um, major genetic uh, predispositions, and um, other hemodynamics uh, related to the disease, uh, pathophysiology, uh, diagnosis, and treatment. We, we also discussed uh, manifestations of uh, cardiomyopathies, uh, which are usually dose of heart failure, and very depending on whether there is systolic dysfunction, diastolic dysfunction, or both. Uh, some cardiomyopathies may also cause chest pain, syncope, and sudden death, um, such as hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So besides the major three classifications, um, also uh, who classifies uh, cardiomyopathy as um, specific to the heart muscle, which uh, could be secondary to infection disorders, uh, metabolic, systemic disease, genetic, sensitive, and toxic. So let's start to explain one by one. Dilated cardiomyopathy could also be um, described as congestive, so the major manifestations would be uh, of the congestive heart failure. Uh, it's also uh, called uh, or named uh, dilated cardiomyopathy or idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy. In hypertrophic, uh, it's also um, described or classified as idiopathic, hypertrophic, subaortic stenosis, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, and restrictive, um, it could also be uh, named uh, infil infiltrative because uh, you would see that there are many diseases such as uh, scleroderma, Schrocken, um lupus, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, etc. that could be uh, major etiological factors of restrictive cardiomyopathy. In dilated cardiomyopathy, um, major, majorly uh, there is a myocardial dysfunction causing heart failure in which uh, ventricular dilation and systolic dysfunction predominates. The symptoms uh, broadly include dyspnea, fatigue, peripheral edema. The main pathophysiology of uh, dilated cardiomyopathy is believed to start with acute myocarditis. Patients uh, tend to have a history of uh, viral syndromes. So one of your questions uh, uh, to the patient would be any flu-like symptoms or any type of viral disease uh, within the past weeks or a recent uh, th less than three months. Uh, this is followed by uh, latent phase, 
which is a phase of the diffuse necrosis of uh, myocytes, uh, myocardial myocytes. And this is basically due to an autoimmune reaction to a uh, virus altering uh, the myocytes and uh, eventually could produce uh, fibrosis of the myocytes. But regardless of the cause, uh, the myocardium basically dilates, uh, which is thinning, is not it doesn't hypertrophy, it does thin, uh, leading to uh, sometimes uh, mitral or tricuspid regurgitation and atrial dilation as well. In dilated cardiomyopathy, this disorder tends to affect both ventricles in most patients. Only the left ventricle in few, um, unless the cause is ischemia, and uh, only the right ventricle, which is very rare. So the majority of the time, both uh, ventricles are affected. It's a disease of unknown etiology, even though, uh, as I said, uh, the most common uh, prior uh, event is a viral disorder producing myocarditis. Um, it does produce uh, mainly systolic dysfunction. So when you look at the echocardiogram, you're going to concentrate on the ejection fraction, and that will be diminished. Again, um, there is increased in heart size uh, and weight, but it's not at the extent uh, of um, myocardial hypertrophy. It's basically due to dilation and thinning. So the thickness of the wall is not hypertrophied. And there's a heart dysfunction out of proportion. So basically, because remember I told you that after um, this autoimmune reaction to virus that alters the myocytes, then um, fibrosis occur. Besides the uh, etiology that I mentioned, uh, the most common cause in um, temperate zones is diffuse coronary artery disease or diffuse ischemic myopathy. Uh, more than 20 viruses can cause this uh, dilated cardiomyopathy, including Coxsackie virus, Chagas disease, um, HIV. So patients should be tested uh, for HIV and also um, mononucleosis, you know, Epstein-Barr viruses, Coxsackie viruses, etc. Uh, other causes besides virus, uh, toxoplasma, uh, to thyro thyrotoxicosis, so patients with hyperthyroidism. Uh, in addition, uh, patients that have been exposed to chemotherapy um, could also have dilated cardiomyopathy. But again, the most common cause is a prior viral infection. Sudden so emotional stress and other hyperadrenergic uh, states could also induce this disease, such as in Takotsubo cardiomyopathy. This is uh, an example of acute apical ballooning cardiomyopathy that could produce dilated uh, cardiomyopathy as well. This is not going to be uh, both ventricles affected, but mostly the apex. The incidence and prognosis of the disease, even though we're discussing dilated cardiomyopathy in this slide, is uh, um, more or less the same for the rest uh, of the classification. Um, it's very rare. It's 3 in 10 uh, cases per 100,000. Um, but uh, mortality is very high, 25% uh, in the first year and uh, to up to 80% in the five in the fifth year. Clinical manifestations of dilated cardiomyopathy. The onset is usually gradual, except in acute myocarditis or in acute uh, apical ballooning, such as in Takotsubo cardiomyopathy. Um, Symptoms depend on which ventricle is affected. Left ventricular dysfunction causes exertional dyspnea. Just concentrate while I'm talking uh, 
of your left ventricle. Remember, the left ventricle is the one that produces cardiac output. So if the cardiac output is compromised, uh, patients will uh, show signs and symptoms of ischemia, and those are shortness of breath. Uh, they could have fatigue. They could have a syncope episode. They, if they have a right ventricular failure, uh, it's the same uh, causes, I'm sorry, the same symptoms of uh, right ventricular uh, failure uh, CHF, uh, such as peripheral edema, uh, jugular vein distension, uh, gastrointestinal manifestations, ascites, and um, alter mental status. Infrequently, the uh, right ventricle is predominant uh, for dilated cardiomyopathy. But if such uh, patients could also have atrial arrhythmias, such as um, atrial fibrillation or SVTs or um, flutter. The highest incidence is in middle age. Blacks are two times more frequent, and uh, men are uh, more frequent than women. They also tend to have an acute presentation which is misdiagnosed uh, most of the time with a viral or respiratory infection in young adults and uh, the next uh, hospitalization um, after this um, unfortunately will be uh, too late with the full bloom um, pulmonary edema and CHF Physical examination, um, before we go into diagnosis, basically remember if they have uh, left ventricular failure, they would show uh, shortness of breath and uh, all the uh, symptoms for uh, heart failure of the left side, which would be orthopnea, parosis monotonotipsnia. Um, they could have shortness of breath arrest, upon exertion or nocturnal. And if you are going to do um, a chest X-ray, uh, this signs uh, would be basically of pulmonary edema or CHF, uh, the curly uh, B lines, etc., or pleural effusions. If it's on the right, uh, we already mentioned uh, all the signs and symptoms. Um, if the patients would have left as well, they would show signs and symptoms of low cardiac output and ischemia, which are, again, fatigue, weakness, uh, hypotension, uh, all the signs and symptoms of hypovolemia, tachycardia, tachypnea, um, and up to syncope episode. Now, how do we diagnose this? Uh, well, you could do a chest X-ray, um, electrocardiogram, echocardiogram, uh, Diagnosis uh, could be done by history, physical examination, and of course exclusion of all the common causes of ventricular failure such as systemic hypertension, any valvulopathy, um, MRI. If acute symptoms or chest pain is present, you're going to be doing also uh, serum cardiac enzymes, uh, ser series of it. Um, Chest X-ray, uh, when you do a chest X-ray, what are the findings that you could see? Uh, again, if it's left uh, heart failure, uh, cardiomegaly, uh, pleural effusion, um, any elevation of uh, pulmonary venous pressure, such as interstitial edema, pulmonary edema, and even up to mild uh, signs with uh, upward distribution of vascular uh, uh, and also the Kirby B lines. If you're doing an EKG, uh, you could see signs uh, of sinus tachycardia, uh, non-specific non uh, ST semen depression, um, Q waves as well. Uh, echocardiogram, remember, is not hypertrophic, so what you will be able to see is a dilated hypokinetic. Um, movement of the uh, ventricles. Uh, you could also see some uh, wall motion abnormalities. Um, sometimes these patients uh, tend to uh, develop a thrombus as well. So you could see the thrombus in the echocardiogram or 
uh, maybe their first manifestation will be a thromboemboli event. Um, again, concentrate on looking at the ejection fraction, uh, which it would be diminished. Cardiac MRI um, is useful because uh, it provides detailed imaging of myocardial structure and function. Um, you could see abnormal myocardial tissue or scarring from fibrosis. And um, very important, uh, coronary angiography, which is required when the diagnosis is in doubt after non-invasive test. So basically, you're going to be doing your uh, physical examination, uh, clinical signs and symptoms, getting your diagnosis, plus chest x-ray, and echocardiogram. That's the essence. Um, so angiography is particularly important when uh, chest pain or several cardiovascular risk factors um, are present and you're doubting if it's, this is a CAD or a dilated cardiomyopathy. So it's after or all non-invasive tests are done. Uh, however, uh, non-obstructive coronary artery lesions detected by angiography may not be the cause of dilated cardiomyopathy. Either a uh, ventricle can be biopsy during the catheterization, but biopsy is not usually done because this um, results can be um, very idiopathic of any other disease. Um, the disease process as well, the fibrosis uh, part could be patchy and uh, results may not change the treatment anyhow. You could also do a 24-hour halter, but basically it's for the protocol of a syncope episode that they develop after a uh, left ventricular um, ejection fraction being diminished. This is a normal chest x-ray. Uh, look at the um, costrophrenic angle. And uh, if you concentrate there, even though it's all over this um, hemidiaphragm, if you look at this is normal vascular distribution and your bronchioles, if you look intercostally, there is no fluid. And if you look here intercostally, there is a pronounced vascularity. And also here, the curvy B lines, uh, very pathognomonic patho of intertitial edema or pulmonary edema in CHF. This is another chest X-ray that uh, shows that patient is in pulmonary edema. Uh, there is major cardiomegaly, even though um, very difficult to determine since it's very fuzzy. Um, costophrenic angles are not seen. So in addition, this patient has uh, pleural effusions as well. As I previously stated, uh, biopsy is not routinely done. Um, the clinical indications that are definitive is when you are um, expecting a transplant. Other possibilities is to uh, basically detect the etiology of the disease of the uh, myocarditis and also to differentiate uh, among the types of uh, cardiomyopathies between hypertrophic, dilated, restrictive, um, uh, basically to, to, to differentiate them. Now, treatment-wise, first, uh, it's very important to be able to treat the cause. So, is the etiology of the uh, dilated cardiomyopathy treatable? So, look at the possible primary causes. If the patient has toxoplasmosis, uh, uh, thyrotoxicosis, um, so target treatment on that. So that has to be corrected. Otherwise, uh, treatment is the same as for heart failure. So if you remember uh, CHF treatment, uh, basically uh, if the patient is in pulmonary edema, you have to uh, give diuretic diuretics. If the patient is in respiratory failure, you'll see next semester how do you treat respiratory failure. So basically, uh, ACE inhibitors. Uh, remember that ACE inhibitors are very, very good for uh, remodeling and hypertension. 
which is one of the risk factors. Uh, beta blockers, you could also use aldosterone receptor blockers, um, diuretics, as I said, digoxin, because remember this is a systolic dysfunction and you need to be able to increase contractility. Um, nitrates can be used, uh, uh, corticosteroids as well. Antivirals are not helpful, even though uh, the most common etiology is the, uh, an inflammatory myocarditis post-viral. Fluid restrictions, um, very significant, uh, salt restriction as well. Limit activity uh, based on functional status, so if you uh, have learned uh, the New York classification of CHF, so you could also uh, limit the activity based on it. Uh, because of mural thrombi, uh, may form prophylactic oral antithrombotic or anticoagulants are often given to help prevent systemic uh, or pulmonary emboli, um, such as warfarin, um, you could uh, also use the aspirin. Um, if the patient has any cardiac arrhythmia, arrhythmias associated and if this is uh, an irregular uh, cardiac arrhythmia, um, you could also uh, combine uh, atrial fibrillation SHAT score uh, with uh, grade 3 CHF uh, treatment. So if, for example, if the patient has a low risk for a thrombi event, you could use aspirin or Plavix. If it's uh, uh, high risk, then you have to use uh, any anticoagulants. Aggressive treatment of heart failure reduces the risk for arrhythmia, but significant cardiac arrhythmias may develop. Um, also have in mind permanent pacemakers uh, may be required if an AV block occurs in these patients with dilated cardiomyopathy. Um, prognosis is very poor, as I previously stated. Um, patients uh, could have an implantable uh, cardioverter defibrillator to prevent death. This is uh, um, when their functional status is, is very, very bad. As I previously stated, uh, beta blockers, uh, anticoagulants, uh, most likely if the ejection fraction is less than 30%, if they have had already a thromboemboli event, even more, um, digoxin could be used, uh, any um, dopamine, dobutamine, if of course if the patients are hospitalized and if there is no other option and um, patients should receive cardiac transplantation. Now let's talk about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. It was first described by the French uh, uh, and Germans around uh, 1900s. Very, very uncommon. Um, it's congenital. It could be congenital or it could be acquired. It's uh, characterized by marked ventricular hypertrophy, no dilation in this case. And remember, in dilation or dilated cardiomyopathy is systolic dysfunction. For hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, there is diastolic dysfunction, but without any increased afterload. For example, um, valvular diseases that have increased afterload would be uh, aortic stenosis or coarctation of the aorta or systemic hypertension. Well, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy does not have increased afterload. Is very, very uncommon, as I said. Um, most commonly is presented as an asymmetric septal defect. So if you imagine your left ventricle, um, the septum is hypertrophied, that produces an impedes the um, relaxation of the ventricle properly 
uh, producing eventually a regurgitation of the mitral valve. It might eventually, when the hypertrophy of the septum um, continues growing, it could block the a, aortic valve, but the most common manifestation is not a poor ejection fraction, is the poor uh, relaxation. Most of the cases of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy are genetic or inherited, even though it could be acquired. At least 50 different mutations uh, could be, a, could be uh, uh, passed, inherit uh, as an autosomal dominant. Um, rarely is acquired. Uh, it may develop in patients that have acromegaly or pheochromocytoma or neurofibromatosis. Before continuing, uh, let me talk a little bit about the path of physiology and then we'll go through diagnosis and treatment. The myocardium is abnormal with cellular and myofibril disarray, dis uh, although these findings are not specific. In the most common form, as I said, uh, the upper interventricular septum below the aortic valve is super hypertrophied and thickened. With little or no hypertrophy of the left ventricular wall. So just think about having the septum, the upper part of the septum, very, very thick, but without the actual ventricular wall. This pattern is called asymmetric septal hypertrophy and appears to accelerate uh, during puberty. So they might have the illness since they're born, but as puberty um, um, gets closer, the process of hypertrophy accelerates. During systole, the septum thickens and sometimes the anterior um, uh, leaflets of the mitral valves already abnormally oriented because of the abnormal septum is sucked towards the septum by a venturi effect of high velocity blood flow, further obstructing the outflow track and decreasing cardiac output. Even though this happens, most commonly relaxation is impeded. The resulting disorder may be termed hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. Less commonly, midventricular hypertrophy leads to an intracavitary gradient and the papillary muscle levels. Apical hypertrophy could also occur, but it's not the uh, most common presentation. So contractility is grossly normal, resulting most of the time with the normal ejection fraction. Later, of course, ejection fraction is elevated because the ventricle has a small volume and empties near completely to maintain cardiac output. Hypertrophy results in a stiff, non-compliant chamber that resists diastolic filling, elevating end diastolic pressure and increasing pulmonary venous pressure. As resistance to filling increases, cardiac output decreases, but that's eventually. So the main thing, the main path of physiology is not systolic dysfunction, is relaxation impairment or diastolic, an effect worsened by any outflow track gradient present. Because tachycardia allows less time for filling, symptoms tend to appear mainly during exercise or tachyarrhythmias. Eventually, of course, coronary blood flow will be impaired, causing angina, syncope, arrhythmias, Flow may be impaired because capillary density relative myocyte site is inadequate. Exercise also lowers peripheral vascular resistance and aortic diastolic pressure. That reduces coronary perfusion pressure and the patients could have a sudden death or a syncope episode or angina. Myocytes eventually die probably because of an imbalance of uh, diffuse ischemia. Uh, 
patients could also have superimposed infective card, uh, endocarditis with obstructive cardiomyopathy. This is the septum that is hypertrophied. Now, they could have also in addition a concentric hypertrophy but or apical hypertrophy but the most common is septum along. This is no more than a representation echocardiography of the uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy where you have the uh, hypertrophied septum and some of the areas of the left ventricle also hypertrophied. Here you could also see that because of a major septum hypertrophy there is mitral regurgitation as well. There is also familiar hypertrophic cardiomyopathy as I said because there are different genes autosomal dominant that could be passed to the offspring such as chromosome 14, 1, 15 and 11. We went through the path of physiology already, so uh, basically there is an impairment of diastolic failing. Increase of muscle mass, filling pressure, and oxygen demand. So patients would have sudden cardiac death, syncope episode. So the signs and symptoms typically, symptoms appear between ages of 20 and 40 years old and are exertional. These patients most of the time, I don't know if you have heard on the news that uh, there's a teenager or a young adult studying exercise, exercising in school or high school and suddenly they died during the um, PE classes. Patients that tend to develop a dyspnea in 90% of the time chest pain in 75 of the, of the time, usually resembling angina. They tend to have palpitations, syncope, uh, because systolic function is preserved. Fatigability, even though could be present, is seldom reported. Syncope usually occurs without warning during exertion, either because outflow obstruction worsens when they increase contractility or because of sustained ventricular tachyarrhythmia. Syncope is the marker of an increased risk of sudden death. So any patient that has uh, obstructive cardiomyopathy or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and has had a syncope episode in the past is a high marker for sudden death, which is thought to result from ventricular tachycardia or fibrillation. Blood pressure and heart rate are usually normal and signs of increased venous pressure are rare. When the outflow tract is obstructive, obstructed, I'm sorry, the carotid poles um, could have what's called uh, um, ed tardus, which patients have an anacrotic pulse, upon palpation, which is very weak, and a narrow pulse pressure. Risk factors, as I said, young age, family history because autosomal uh, dominant effect, um, sustained VTAC or SVTs in the past, uh, history in the family of sudden cardiac death, a recurrent syncope episode, um, bradyarrhythmias as well because these patients could go into um, Uh, blocks. Recommendations for athletic activity. Uh, patients should avoid uh, most competitive uh, sports whether or not symptoms are present. Very low risk uh, in elderly population more than 30 years old but they may participate in athletic activity but with um, uh, cautious. Diagnosis uh, is suspected based on a typical murmur and symptoms 
Suspicious is increased if the patient has a history of unexplained syncope or a familial history of unexplained sudden death. Unexplained syncope in young athletes should always raise the suspicions of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy must be distinguished from aortic stenosis and CAD, which cause similar symptoms. EKG and two-dimensional echocardiogram and MRI should be done to be able to distinguish that. This is uh, basically the recommendations again for uh, patients that are more than 30 years old, um, may participate in athletic activity if all of the followings are absent. They cannot have ventricular tachycardia or family history of sudden death or history of syncope um, or not having severe hemodynamic abnormalities, uh, no exercise induced hypotension. Um, mitral regurg, paroxysmal AFib, or any abnormalities in myocardial perfusion. To be able to continue uh, diagnosing um, cardiomyopathies, um, you could do a chest x-ray. It's often done, but it's usually normal because the ventricles are not dilated. Remember, it's most of the time the septum or the apex. Patients with syncope or sustained arrhythmia should be evaluated as an inpatient. You could do an exercise stress test or 24-hour halter, basically for the arrhythmias. EKG, uh, what do you think it will be showing? Uh, basically, left ventricular hypertrophy. And as you already covered, uh, how do you determine that the patient has left ventricular hypertrophy? because um, they have an S wave in lead V1 plus an R wave in lead V5. They could also have uh, pathological cues in lead 1, AVL, V5, and V6 due to the asymmetric uh, hypertrophy. Two-dimensional Doppler echocardiography uh, should be done to be able to differentiate all the types of cardiomyopathy and of course if the patient have uh, symptoms of uh, uh, syncope or any uh, major arrhythmia cardiac catheterization should be done and to determine as well if this is uh, CAD you know coronary artery disease versus uh, uh, cardiomyopathy now let's talk about treatment uh, is directed primarily at abnormal diastolic compliance. So beta blockers and rate limit calcium channel blockers with a lower arterial dilation capacity along or combined are the mainstay. So you should give beta blockers or verapamil um, by decreasing myocardial contractility these drugs dilate the heart. By slowing the heart rate, they prolong the diastolic filling period. Both effects decrease outflow obstruction. So that would end in an improvement of diastolic dysfunction. You could also add um, nitrates, uh, diuretics, ACE inhibitors, um, pacing or of course, surgery-wise, myo myomectomy, because the main problem is the uh, septum hypertrophied. This is to be able to differentiate a, a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy versus aortic stenosis. Remember that uh, the murmur in um, aortic stenosis is uh, a crescendo-decrescendo murmur that radiates to the carotid arteries. Patients would have a weak uh, S2 and an S4. Uh, they have what's called parvus uh, etardo that is basically no more than a weak small pulse upon palpation of the carotids. Um, the murmur in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy would increase in Valsalva maneuver and it would decrease in squatting that it doesn't happen in aortic stenosis.
The murmur in aortic stenosis is best heard in the second intercostal space. And uh, patients with uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy would have a uh, thrill or a click absent. And the murmur is best heard at the fourth intercostal space. All the causes of uh, hypertrophic my uh, cardiomyopathy, uh, diabet diabetic patients, uh, um, I'm sorry, infants of diabetic mothers or any amyloid, these are genetic diseases that could produce it. Um, this is basically that um, patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, they tend to have an unusual pattern of the vent of the septum of the ventricle. Um, patients uh, tend to have a bizarre EKG pattern compared to uh, patients that have a normal heart. Uh, the athlete heart is a uniform cardiomyopathy. Uh, it's not asymmetric. In the elderly, if they survive, they tend to have most of the time uh, a concentric left ventricular hypertrophy more than uh, the septum. Uh, it is associated with hypertension, um, but they tend to have, of course, at that time, it's not only diastolic dysfunction, but also systolic dysfunction. Because over time, remember that the outflow to the aorta also decreases. They tend to have what's called the sigmoid septum, which is all asymmetric and fibrotic. That's called the gramma sem. Now let's talk about restrictive cardiomyopathy. So try to concentrate basically on the um, pathophysiology, how do you diagnose, and how do you treat. Don't um, try to memorize any specific genetic disease or or this particular characteristics uh, of the elderly. Now, restrictive cardiomyopathy is um, also the hallmark as hypertrophic is diastolic dysfunction. It's characterized by a non-compliant ventricular wall that resists diastolic filling. Most commonly is on the left ventricle, but both ventricles could be affected. It's the least prevalent form of cardiomyopathy, so it's rare. But it's most of the time produced by fibrosis of the endocardion and subendocardion. There is another rare form that is a non-obliterative, which the actual infiltration is absent but there is a rigid ventricle which impairs ventricular filling. It does resemble constricted pericarditis, so if you could imagine a patient with scleroderma, very, very rigid collagen deposit and joints and skin, the heart, the pericardium is also exactly the same. It's very, very rigid. It cannot relax to have a normal ventricular filling or diastolic function. So the etiology um, is an infiltration. It could be amyloidosis, it could be sarcoidosis, it could be a scleroderma, it could be rheumatoid arthritis, um, it could be a hyper uh, syndrome, um, it could be Fabry disease or hemochromatosis or carcinomatosis or radiation therapy as well. What happens here is that the endocardium thickens or infiltrate. That infiltration produces a compensatory hypertrophy due to fibrosis. But it's, it's more symmetric, it's more uniform homogeneous. As the result, as a result of this, the mitral or tricuspid valve malfunction as well, leading to regurgitation. 
endocardial thickening uh, is uh, um, produced. Uh, patients tend to have blocks instead of tachycardia. Um, there's a rigid non-compliant ventricle. Uh, there's this impairment of diastolic filling. Um, high filling pressure that also leads to pulmonary hypertension. Um, eventually, of course, there is a compensatory hypertrophy as well. And all these types of cardiomyopathy tend to have high risk for thrombi events. When is it excluded? Um, when you do an echocardiogram, that you don't need to memorize this, but left ventricle and diastolic dimensions are greater than 7 centimeter, or the myocardial thickness is greater than 1.7, or the end diastolic volume is greater than 150 mLs, um, or the ejection fraction is less than 20%, because remember, it's not based on systolic dysfunction, it's diastolic. It could be, again, uh, non-infiltrative, even though it's uh, less common. Uh, diseases that could produce, again, amyloidosis, scleroderma, sarcoidosis, um, hemochromatosis, Fabry disease, uh, or any other disease that could produce uh, uh, fibrosis of the myocardium, metastases, radiation, etc. Clinical manifestations are basically um, the right or the left heart failure, um, exertion of dyspnea or thopnea, or if the right ventricle is affected, peripheral edema, jugular vein distension, uh, fatigue results from a fixed cardiac output due to resistance to ventricular filling. Uh, patients could also have AB blocks if they have left ventricular malfunction, is angina or syncope. Physical examination detects basically a quiet precordium, low volume, um, pulmonary crackles, uh, jugular vein distension, uh, S4 is present, S3 as well, uh, due to high pressure S4 and due to volume overload S3, or basically uh, distension uh, of the uh, ventricular wall due to uh, uh, fibrosis or stretching. Pulsos uh, paradoxus never occurs. Restrictive uh, versus constrict constrictive. Um, constrictive pericarditis, uh, even though the manifestations are exactly the same, uh, patients tend to have history of tuberculosis, uh, pericarditis in the past, or any vascular disease. In restrictive cardiomyopathy, think about the collagen diseases uh, or radiation therapy or cardiac surgery. Before treatment, how do you diagnose? Exactly the same. Echocardiogram, uh, chest x-ray, uh, cardiac catheterization, etc. So how do you treat? There's no satisfactory medical treatment because you have to treat the underlying disease, the scleroderma, the myo, uh, myositis, the lupus, uh, etc. But uh, to be able to treat the symptoms uh, with caution, um, diuretics may be used for patients with edema or pulmonary vascular congestion, but has to be very cautious because they can lower the preload. The non-compliant ventricles depend on preload to maintain cardiac output. Remember that. The joxin does little to alter hemodynamic abnormalities and actually may cause serious arrhythmias in cardiomyopathy due to amyloidosis or any uh, collagen disease. If the heart rate is elevated, beta blockers or calcium channel blockers, but again with cautious in low dosages. How do you reduce afterload in these patients? Nitrates, but also could cause hypotension. So everything you're going to do with very, very high cautious. Um, in these patients, uh, you could also do myomectomy. That even even though it's not the septum, uh, you would have to do ablation to basically the whole pericardium uh, to ameliorate the symptoms. Pacemaker implantation may help. 
implantable uh, defibrillator. And don't forget the treatment is basically targeting uh, the specific etiology, the hemochromatosis, the sarcoidosis, etc. Transplantation is not recommended because the disorder may recur if the trans in the transplanted heart. Remember that all these diseases are systemic. They have no cure. But this is the end of the uh, cardiomyopathy presentation. And uh, your professor will follow with some questions.